throughout our community. So without further ado, um, I, I'm going to um, pass the mic. But um, before I do that, if you would not mind, if you are not um, speaking, if you could mute, that would be really helpful just to prevent feedback um, from the speakers. And uh, we'll circle back um, to, to um, questions and conversations as we go. But without further ado, I wanted to um, invite, we'll come back to this in just a second, but I wanted to invite to the mic um, our distinguished guest, Mayor Nancy Vaughn, who is the mayor of the city of Greensboro. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you, um, even if it is only virtually. We know that we need to continue this work no matter what the circumstances are. Um, last evening, the city of Greensboro passed it a resolution in support of um, National Child Prevention, uh, National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And that is so important every year. But as Kelly mentioned earlier, this year has been especially challenging. We know that people are, have been in their homes and they've been in circumstances that is um, unusual. And sometimes home isn't the safest place to be. And it is great that we have the Kellen organization and other organizations through our community that help us reach the most vulnerable among us, whether it's children's or families in crisis. You know, we've seen a rise in our homicide rate this year. Um, last year, there were more acquaintance homicides than there had been in many years combined. So we know that families are under significant stress. And I appreciate that everybody is taking time out of their day today to talk about this important issue as we do on most months, but to have a month where we can really focus on what we can do to move ahead and how we can help those among us is so very important. So I wanna thank the Kellen organization for everything you do on a regular basis, for helping us respond and for putting this group together so we know what we can do moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Mayor Vaughn. We appreciate your time. I'm sure you're pulled in lots of different directions. So we appreciate you joining us and, and um, for your support of kids and families throughout um, our community. So thank you so much. Um, next up as, uh, for welcoming remarks is um, Council Member Cyril Jefferson, who is part of High Point City Council. Um, he is a husband, father, social and, um, innovator, currently serving on the High Point City Council. For more than a decade, he's focused his civic and professional work to socially responsible causes and creating purposeful opportunities for community betterment. He's the principal consultant at Changed Often, LLC, where he leads a team of change agents in leveraging collaborative and innovative solutions to building capacity. And so we're so excited to uh, have him join us today. So passing the mic to you. Dr. Graves, I appreciate that. Uh, it's so great to be on with you all today for an event uh, that is very important to our community. Myself, I've worked in education and nonprofit for years, and I've often proclaimed myself as a champion for youth. Uh, whether it was teaching high school Spanish or being the associate director at Andrews High School for our, our national award-winning marching band, we felt that every student who was in our care had the opportunity to go on to do amazing things. And so when I think about the issue of child abuse, I couldn't see anything more important for us to recognize and to esteem and our great work so that we can tackle and try to take care of. Uh, and so last night, similar to the city of Greensboro, where Mayor Vaughn alluded to their resolution, our governing body and of the High Point City Council also passed a resolution for April 2021 uh, in recognition of, of, of Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, we appreciate Dr. Graves, we appreciate the entire team at the Kellen Foundation for the incredible work that you all do um, to really get out and be a sounding horn on these kinds of issues. We appreciate all of you all here who are also clearly joining as ambassadors, as allies, as champions uh, for our young people so that we can stand up together to prevent this from going further. Uh, I do hope that you all will enjoy today's conversation and also hope that you'll feel free to reach out if uh, you find that I, uh, any of my colleagues or anything that we're doing can be a resource for you. Take care and be blessed. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you and all of the work that you're doing at High Point and really throughout the entire community. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Um, next um, for remarks is Chief Brian James and um, Chief James joined the Greensboro Police Department on February 16th, 1996, serving in various roles across the department. He's a, 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 um, a graduate of Page High School, so um, locally grown and, and raised and most recently became our, our um, City of Greensboro Police Chief, I think at a really critical time and we're really excited and honored to have him here with us today. So Chief Brian James. Uh, thank you, Dr. Graves, for giving me an opportunity to speak, and uh, and thank you for what the Kellen Foundation does. But uh, I just want to say, you know, children are our most valuable resource, and uh, they're going to be our future leaders, uh, next mayors, governors, business owners, uh, medical workers, and even public safety officials. So it's incumbent upon each one of us to make sure we do everything in our power to ensure uh, that our children are safe and that they have the resources available to reach their full potential. So that means that, that we as a community, uh, we're gonna play a role uh, as a community to protect our children and organizations like the Greensboro Police Department, the Kellen Foundation, and many other organizations play a role in making sure that our community is successful in raising our children and keeping them safe. Um, as we look across uh, our city and across our whole community, uh, children in poverty especially are experiencing more abuse and neglect. And this abuse just isn't physical with cuts and bruises, but it's also uh, emotional and psychological. Uh, abuse and neglect uh, exposure uh, and exposure to violence have lifelong impacts, such as increased risk of injury, uh, future violence victimization, substance abuse, delayed brain development, and, and a lot of other issues uh, that just really uh, inhibit a child's ability to be successful. So we have to bring attention to this issue, not only this month, and under, but understand that this is a year round commitment from our community uh, to make sure that our children have a chance. Uh, no child should be subject to abuse or neglect. Uh, it's not only the parent's responsibility, the guardian's responsibility, but our entire community. And as we have uh, dealt with uh, this pandemic this last year, it's even more critical uh, because there are so many voices that are being silenced. So I thank you for the opportunity uh, to serve in my current role, as well as the opportunity for the Greensboro Police Department to serve the entire community. And just know that we are partners in this uh, with the entire community, not just organizations, but individual citizens and in making sure that we keep our children safe is very critical uh, to our future and it's all of our responsibility. So thank you, Dr. Graves, for giving me an opportunity to speak and uh, we'll continue to move forward with you and uh, making sure that our children have a chance. Thank you so much. I could not agree more with everything that you just said. Thank you so much for sharing the comments. And one of the things that we know is that in order to build strong kids, we need strong adults and strong communities to help guide them. And so that multi-generational approach is just so key. Um, and so um, our next speaker today is um, none other than, I'm really excited to have Sharon with us here, Sharon Hurst. She's the president and CEO of Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina. She's gonna give us kind of a landscape of what's happening across North Carolina and some action steps that we could um, consider to continue to move the needle to address child abuse and really build strong families across, across our community. So Sharon serves as the president and CEO and she leads a team that focuses on making prevention a priority for North Carolina. She builds capacities for communities to have the knowledge, support and resources that they need to prevent child abuse. And just as an aside, Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina does so much across the state and really supports um, communities in so many ways. And so we're excited to, to have Sharon with us and to learn from her. So Sharon. Thank you so much, Kelly. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here and um, have deep, deep gratitude to you and your entire team because you are leaders in our state and you are partners in prevention, so thank you. I wanna take a, a minute to just give a very quick overview of Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina for those of you that don't know who we are. We were founded 42 years ago and we're part of a national network led by Prevent Child Abuse America. Our work has really evolved over the last 42 years, starting with educating the public about abuse and neglect is an issue that we all need to care about to today where we're focusing on moving our systems of support upstream to focus on preventing abuse and neglect from ever happening in the first place. And we do this by, as Kelly said, building capacity at the program level and in communities and to prevent maltreatment 
by making prevention a priority, by advocating for programs and investments that support and strengthen families. So Kelly, if you could move the slides ahead to um, where, where I said we could start um, on slide eight. Um, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about my childhood. So I grew up in, this, in the 1960s and 70s and childhood was really idyllic. We knew every one of our neighbors, parents knew all the children in the neighborhood and all of us as children knew that parents were trusted adults. We spent most of our time outside after school and in the summertime instead of inside on our electronic devices. And we often romanticize that time and think of it as being perfect. Um, yet in reality, we were living in really, really turbulent times. I was a toddler when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And I have vivid memories of being on a family vacation at Disney World and my father was watching Watergate hearings on TV at night. As a child, I was sheltered from hearing much about the civil rights movement, Vietnam, and the massive cultural changes that were happening in our country. But there are a lot of echoes of those same struggles today. And today we don't have that same sense of community connection and support. The pandemic has made it worse. Even before COVID was part of our reality, children were exposed far too often to traumatic experiences Active shooter drills were common in schools. The opioid crisis and the pandemic now are exposing too many children to substance addiction in their homes. The internet is exposing too many children to pornography and community violence is much too prevalent. It's concerning as we think about how those changes in our culture impact not just the environment that children are growing up in, but the ways that it changes how their brains and bodies develop and how that could affect their health for a lifetime. That's why we're focusing Child Abuse Prevention Month on how anyone can be a connection for children in your community. If you can go to the next slide. Um, we've built this year's campaign on the Protective Factors Framework and they're listed here, along with our Connections Matter campaign. Connections Matter is built on the science that tells us that relationships are the biggest builders of babies' brains and they're the greatest buffer and healer of trauma. Connections Matter NC is a campaign that strives to promote the building of more resilient, compassionate, and trauma-informed communities to allow all children and individuals to succeed. You can go to slide 10. The core messages that we're trying to get out this year are rooted in the intersecting topics of adverse childhood experiences, trauma, brain development, and resilience. Connections Matter talks about the negative effects of ACEs on brain development and future outcomes and how caring connections serve as the primary buffer in the negative effects of trauma. You can learn more about Connections Matter at connectionsmatternc.org. And there are lots of ways that you can help us participate this month to help us spread the message. Um, the first, if you go to the next slide, you can join us for our Be a, Be a Connection campaign, which actually kicks off next week. Um, you go to the next slide, um, all you have to do is to post a photo or a video with the hashtag be a connection and with the sign that Chris is holding there in her, in her hands and use our pre-written prompts and ideas to post uh, the caption ideas that we have on our website to post a video or a selfie. Um, all of it's on our uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month Toolkit online at preventchildabusenc.org. And I really wanna encourage you to do this both through your organizations and individually, because all of you that are on this call are community leaders that can influence other people. Go to the next slide. I just wanna very quickly mention that pinwheel plantings, and many of you know us as the pinwheel folks, have historically been our opportunity to help communities and groups come together to recognize Child Abuse Prevention Month and to start this conversation. Because of the pandemic, we're recommending that we find other ways to plant pinwheels on a smaller scale, like in our front yards. So there's not as much emphasis this year. Um, I wanna spend the rest of my time, if you can skip ahead, um, I wanna go to the slide about the American Recovery Act. I really wanna finish up talking about hope. Um, we are at an extraordinary time in, in our nation's history. We've had more than 20 years of education and advocacy around adverse childhood experiences. More policymakers are understanding the importance of investing early in a child's development. And in 2019, the CDC released its vital signs report that linked five of the top 10 leading causes of death to adverse childhood experiences. 
Plus, there's a growing science that tells us that positive childhood experiences can buffer the impact of ACEs, and we need to be investing in making more of those positive childhood experiences happen. So this American Rescue Plan Act that we've all been talking about in the news, it passed just a couple of weeks ago. I want you to think about it as a once in a generation investment. That's a game changer for children and families. It is, it is the biggest deal that I can remember in my 25 plus year career advocating for kids and families. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what these mean. Um, there's um, $150 million emergency allocation for home visiting in North, across the country. And that's gonna allow uh, to pay for virtual home visits, technology for parents, and wrap those home visiting services with concrete supports like diapers and grocery cards. That's a big deal. That's, 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 that's a significant amount of money and a really critical evidence-based way to intervene. Um, there's a $250 million one-time allocation over the next two years for community-based child abuse prevention grants um, to all 50 states. And that supports those um, resources, programs, and concrete supports at the local level. It supports all of the public awareness that we do at Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina. It supports programs like Incredible Year, Strengthening Family, Circle of Parents, Triple P, Family Strengthening Programs in North Carolina. I want to put this into some context for you. Every year for the last 16 years, the national allocation for CBCAP was $60 million. This is $250 million. We're going, we normally get $1.1 million in North Carolina for prevention. This one-time allocation, DSS confirmed it for me yesterday, it's $7.2 million that we can spend over the next two years. That is a big deal. It's a really big deal. So exciting. Um, plus the, the act itself also is providing unemployment benefits to people who've lost jobs, rent, utility assistance. We've all been hearing about the $1,400 payments um, support for local governments. It expands the child tax credit to $3,000 per child, and then another $3,600 credit for children under the age six. And those are both refundable and advanceable, which is really, really important because it puts more money in people's pockets. It also expands access to safe and reliable, reliable child care, which is also a, a key strategy for preventing child maltreatment access to health care and unemployment. This, I, I can't say it enough, this is a big, 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 big deal for families, especially for children. When we normally talk about public investments in child abuse prevention, people normally are talking about CPS. They're talking about foster care and adoption services. This begins to move the conversation and programming upstream to focus on concrete economic supports that are so, so critical for prevention Study after study after study is showing us that when we increase wages and take home pay through tax credits for families, CPS rates drop, foster care entry is prevented. Boosting a family's financial security improves parents' ability to, to meet their basic needs. And it also has been shown to reduce parental stress and depression, both big risk factors for child maltreatment. In particular, I wanna focus on the fact that child neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment. We often don't talk about it as much specifically, but child neglect is more likely in families that are experiencing an overload of stress, as so many families have during this pandemic. The weight of economic stress and poverty in particular can overload parents' ability to provide the supportive relationships that children need. Severe and persistent stress can overload our ability to, to manage emotions. This explains why recessions have historically contributed to a rise in child abuse and neglect. But the good news is that we also know that reducing the financial burdens on families and adding supports can make a huge difference and quickly. Providing stable income support like the recovery rebate legislation that's actually being introduced today in our state legislature can reduce the load that families across North Carolina are facing right now and if we act now, we can make sure that children and families can keep moving forward, even during these really challenging times. So I want to invite you to join us in advocating for legislation like this, like this um, recovery rebate that's very much like a state earned income tax credit for paid family and medical leave that we know families need across the lifespan, for paid 
time for sick leave and sick leave to be able to be used for things like kin care and safe days so that families can get the treatment they need without risking losing their jobs. These are all policies that are, that are being considered this year at our legislature. We know these things are good public policy. It's got an incredible return on investment in our educational criminal justice and healthcare system. It's good for families. I firmly believe that these investments are not only gonna lay the foundation, but be a game changer for this generation's children. And I'm grateful that we're living in this time where we're seeing this upstream movement in public policy because we know today better than ever before that what happens in childhood lasts a lifetime. I thank you for everything that you all do to build safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all of North Carolina's children for being part of this movement. And I'm excited to see what you all do next in Guilford County. Thank you so much. Sharon, thank you so much for sharing all this. It is incredibly exciting to see this movement and to see what's happening. Um, in terms of kind of moving upstream. Um, if you have questions for Sharon, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And uh, we didn't mention this earlier, but we would love to, to just know about more who's on the call. So feel free to mention your name and agency if you'd like to in the chat box as well. But if you have questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat box and we're gonna be collecting questions and addressing them towards the end. Um, but I'm going to pass the baton to Angela, who's gonna introduce um, uh, Rory our, um, to talk about the local landscape. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Rory Statton. She is a supervisor at Guilford County DHHS uh, within um, the Child, Pro Child Protective Services. Um, and Kellen Foundation and specifically the CRI team, um, we know Rory very well through our interactions and referrals. Um, we've worked closely with her for years and um, I can just attest to how much important work she does, um, how fortunate we are to have her on the call with us. Um, and with that, Rory, I will um, pass the mic to you and uh, let you share a little bit about what is going on on the um, local scale. All right, thank you all for having me this afternoon. Um, again, I'm Rory Staten and I supervise our CPS Child Protective Services intake um, team for Guilford County. So basically all reports that come through, Child Protective Services reports that come through in Guilford County um, are received here by my team. And um, I often say that we truly do meet families on the worst day of their lives. Nobody wants to see a Child Protective Services worker show up at their door, but that's what we do. Um, and of course, our job is to try to keep children safe and we're committed to doing just that. Some of the local trends that we've seen, and let me just say, as you know, others have already said, the pandemic has certainly impacted our work here at DSS, just as other agencies. But with the pandemic, we certainly saw a decrease in reports for the first probably three or four months into um, last year. After that, it started picking back up and kind of leveled off, and that's kind of where we are right now. But the pandemic certainly impacted one of our main referral sources and that being the schools. So we saw a, de saw a decrease in reports. Again, we kind of gotten back on level ground in terms of the number of reports. But I would say overall, um, what I'm seeing here at Intake and throughout Children's Services is that there definitely has been a decrease overall in the number of reports, but an increase in the severity of the cases that we've received. And um, I would say probably the opioid epidemic certainly impacts the severity of the cases. We've um, received a number of reports and on any given day, I will um, screen a report that involves, unfortunately, a parent overdosing in the presence of a child. And obviously that requires our immediate um, attention to that. So that has certainly um, been one of our primary sources of being involved with families is um, the substance abuse epidemic, as well as domestic violence. That continues to be one of the main um, maltreatment causes that, um, that brings us to a family's door, substance abuse and domestic violence. Other maltreatment um, issues that would cause us to be involved are your general neg neglect issues, such as lack of care, um, truancy, that certainly has increased now with the pandemic and children not logging on or not being readily available 
um, to participate in, in classes or you know, in classes. So we've seen an increase where that particular area is concerned. And um, improper discipline has become one of our main issues as well that again, leads us to be involved with families. So those are just some of the local trends that we're seeing. Um, one of the other things that I've noticed, and this just kind of, I realized it the other day and I'm not sure what to attribute it to, is that more parents are being, um, are serving as reporters on the other parents. So we've seen an increase where that's concerned locally. Um, again, substance abuse and domestic violence cause us to be involved. Right now we've got approximately 450 yeah, 450 children in custody, and we're seeing fewer children return home, but that can certainly be attributed to um, the pandemic again and not being able to have court as we typically would, which would allow children to go home or, or um, visitation to be increased so that we could work towards um, reunification um, in, a, um, in a different manner. So because of that, um, the number of kids in custody haven't necessarily increased, but just the number of children returning home certainly hasn't increased. Um, that's really kind of what we're seeing in terms of local trends here. And um, just in, in terms of what our agency is doing to acknowledge um, Child Abuse Prevention Month, of course, we do have the pinwheels out front of our, at, at our um, office. And last Thursday, our county commissioners um, acknowledged Child Abuse Prevention Month at the commissioners meeting. And typically we would do more of a program um, for Child Abuse Prevention Month along with the pinwheels. But again, with the pandemic, we were not able to do that this year, but we're certainly, um, our workers are still on the front line. Um, I salute all service providers for being out there, providing services to family in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of, everything that they deal with on a daily basis, I certainly commend them because, you know, at the end of the day, we all want to keep children safe. And that's what we're charged to do. And that's exactly what we do. So, thank you. Rory, thank you so much for mm -hmm. sharing that information. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really helpful, I think, to have kind of the statewide landscape from Sharon and kind of seeing the local landscape from, mm -hmm. from Rory. And, um, and if you have questions for Rory, please put them in the chat box. We'll continue to collect those and address those. Um, we're gonna be moving now to, to from, we went from the kind of the statewide landscape to the local landscape. And now we're gonna go to our breakout rooms to kind of talk and, and build conversation around even locally, what could we do together to address um, and prevent child abuse? Um, and so I'm gonna pass the baton to Lisa. Lisa, are you on? Lisa Taylor, are you there? Just trying to get myself off of mute. Go. I'm off <laughs> mute. I'm off mute. Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you again for being here with us to all of our distinguished guests and also the ones that continuously, all the agencies and the individuals that always come meet with us every single month. We appreciate you. Um, and I just wanted to say that we're getting ready to break out. And this breakout is time for us to get our brains spinning the wheels, just spinning as we continue to talk about um, child abuse. And we're going to be focusing on these top three questions. Um, the first is going to be, what can I do? Basically, it's personal. What am I doing to prevent child abuse? What am I doing to prevent it? What am I doing it to make others aware? What am I doing? So make that one personal. Number two is going to be, what can we do? What can we do as an agency, as an organization? What are we doing to prevent child abuse? What are we doing? What, how are we making this thing more evident for everyone to be able to understand and to see? What are we doing as an agency and as an organization? And number three, what can we all do as a community? What can we do concerning policy? What can we all do and what are all of us doing as one unit basically to prevent child abuse? So at this time, we're going to be able to break out. We wanna make sure that we're talking about our collective values. We wanna make sure that we are coming together and, and stating what we feel as individuals, agencies and community, but being able to put that in the group. So let's not be a hush-hush group. Let's not be the ones that's not talking. 
Let's really get our brains spinning and the wheels spinning so we can come back with some great solutions and bring it back to the table. All right. And with that being said, I'm getting ready to just um, randomly like whoosh us out to break rooms, breakout rooms. And so you'll be invited to a breakout room here. And here we go.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. As folks are going to kind of kind of getting loaded back in, I think we have all the groups back now. And so we're going to do some brief discussion and report outs, just summaries of what the groups um, discussed. Is there a group that would like to start? Um, I don't mind starting. I think I was in group one, but I really did not pay attention to the numbers, but we had um, some fantastic folks. I wish we had a little more time because there was a lot of conversation um, flowing and would love to have heard from more folks, but um, hopefully we can continue these conversations through the month. Mm -hmm. So with that said, I'll jump in. Um, Sharla from Guilford County Schools reported that they have um, mandatory reporting training for everyone. And that goes from administration custodians, cafeteria workers, and I think that's phenomenal to bring that awareness. Um, YMCA doing the same thing, a lot of prevention training, um, mandatory reporting, assessments. Um, that includes volunteers on policies and procedures. I think that's fantastic. And the biggest thing is supporting parents and families and continuing the education, so. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and go next. Um, this is Lisa and I was a part of group three. And um, for question number one, Natalie talked about um, making sure that you are connecting with families that might be in high stress, be available for them. And uh, if you can keep children, if you could help someone out individually, then help them by being able to stay with them, give them that assurance that they have basically some more helping hands. And also if you see someone, um, in the store shopping, whatever that looks like, you know, you're out and about, take a moment to be able to smile. If you see them struggling, you know, it's a lot happening, give them eye contact. Guess what? They can't see the smile behind the mask, but they can see your eyes, right? So just look happy in your eyes. And if you can say kind words, make sure that you do that. And then for also, Farheed said, be a role model be positive and always give encouragement. Um, Tamira said support, make sure you are providing client support and support those. Give resources where you can and provide respite care where you can as well. And then for question number two, um, coordinate life skill classes and, and coping skill classes. And Christina talked about being community partners in a system working together to connect upstream services, making sure we have a good navigation system in place and also that there's plenty of strength-based situations out there that we're able to provide again more help when it comes to that alignment and maps of services making sure that we're being able to do that and then um, for question number three Mary talked about breaking those cycles just like we know that the Kellen Foundation is definitely doing and so many of you on the call breaking those cycles and Keisha's talked to talked about you know stop turning the blind eye. Step up to the plate and everybody do your part as one. Thank you so much. That's group number three, fabulous group of people. And I was running my mouth so much I couldn't even finish. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm gonna jump in. We were um, group number two. Um, a lot of what we discussed has been uh, shared already, but I'll just kind of amplify. Um, we talked a lot about relationships, um, both on the individual organization and community level as being kind of the most pivotal component of prevention. Um, so we heard um, a lot of people shared what they're doing on the individual level is um, just being a friend, being a neighbor, reaching out to um, parents and individuals that we know, um, introducing ourselves, uh, keeping in touch with people and reaching out and building rapport so that um, if someone is in need that they feel safe and comfortable reaching out and um, expressing that. Um, we also talked about um, for those that have uh, young children or children that are in school, getting to know our children's friends, um, getting to know their families as best we can, building relationships with them, um, making a point to check in with um, some of the children that we know um, who might be a little more reserved, who um, might be kind of um, a little bit muted or acting differently, just being aware and um, having that foundation of trust and relationship to kind of move forward and, and um, reach out and act in that way. Um, organizations, we talked about um, specific groups that um, have been developed um, from both infancy, um, you know, birth to all throughout kind of that develop, those developmental stages. Um, so breastfeeding groups, we talked about um, groups within um, both our organizations and our churches. Um, 
addressing the gaps that are in the community that we might not automatically think of when we think of child abuse. Um, so uh, someone mentioned housing, um, someone mentioned transportation as being kind of the two primary ones trying to address those um, kind of fundamental needs um, as a way to kind of um, prevent child abuse in a more um, indirect but really important way. Um, and then as a community, we talked about um, kind of finding, looking for those groups, trying to unify them, lift them up. Um, and we were really uh, very hopeful and encouraged to hear um, Sharon kind of outline what um, that recent act entails. It sounds like a lot of the work that we are all doing um, has been heard. So that definitely gave us a lot of um, a lot of hope. So just continuing to lift up families and and being kind of the squeaky wheel uh, wheel for uh, leaders and people that can influence. So group two was awesome. Yeah, it sounds like some really good ideas uh, have, have been generated and lots of ways that we can uh, individually move the needle in our organizations and our families and our neighborhoods and also as a community and in our in the systems that we work within and continuing to be that champion for children and really kind of pushing the um, um, the issue to make sure it stays front and center. And there's lots of opportunities to do that. So wonderful brainstorming. We will compile all of the ideas that our collective group has has um, come up with and, and, and send them to everyone so that you all have the same information and can utilize it in your agencies, in your circles, in your families, in your you know, church groups, in your communities and things like that so that you can have that same information. So um, a couple of folks have um, asked about um, our pinwheels uh, efforts in particular. And so I'm gonna share um, the screen again to show you a little bit about um, what is available now in Guilford County. Um, can you see our, can you see the screen again? Yes. Okay, great. So um, locally, one of the things statewide we've been talking about be the connection. There's also a movement of past the pinwheel, which really is this idea of how do we continue to spread the word and pass the pinwheel and get more people involved in the movement to prevent child abuse and build strong families. Um, and so locally you'll see um, pinwheel gardens that are popping up across Guilford County um, in neighborhoods, in churches, um, in the police stations and things like that. I wanted to um, share with you a resource that might be of help. Oops, let's see, I'm gonna go to this page. Um, on our, um, prime, our main website, um, you'll be able to find uh, resources to order your own pinwheels as well. And so if we go to the main site, I just popped up here, there's a little video that you can post on your social media, but there's also a printable order form and an online order form to, um, to get the pinwheels and yard signs or whatever kind of setup you would like for your yard um, or church or you know business organization. Uh, but I also just wanted to highlight the fact that there are uh, there's a calendar of April events that are all free that you can download here and an action-oriented research guide uh, resource guide based on research that you can also download that has some additional tips and tools for how neighbors can help, how communities can help, et cetera. So you can feel free to share that resource if it's of help to you as we continue to, to raise awareness um, to prevent child abuse. So I wanted to share that, um, that piece. Um, in terms of the April events that might be of interest moving forward tomorrow, if you'd like to join us, we're doing a free community resilience model training CREM training as it's called. And it's really all about how do we um, build our stress tolerance skills so that when stress comes, we're able to manage it. And we know that when we're able to manage our stress as adults, we're better able to be positioned to be um, the kind of influence we want to be on children. So this is one of those upstream approaches that helps us to really focus on our own well-being so that we're in best position to help others as well. So this is from it's helpful for providers, for parents, for for even adolescents, um, the tools can be used in a lot of different ways. So that free training is tomorrow. We also have some additional trainings coming up that are listed on the screen, um, focusing on understanding and assessing trauma in children. That training is Friday. Um, we'll be doing a community pinwheel planting at Ben and Jerry's at Friendly Center on Saturday. So it's supposed to be beautiful weather, I'm hoping. I think it's continuing through the weekend. Um, it looked like it, at least in the 70s. Um, and so if you are out and about, feel free to stop by and help plant a pinwheel garden at Friendly Center. Um, and we're doing a virtual family resource fair or Guilford Partnership for Children is hosting it and we're part of it next week. Um, and it'll be all about what Lisa mentioned, navigating resources and making sure that we can get families connected to the resources that they need. 
Um, and then for those that might be sports involved, there's a free trauma-informed coaching session that's really focusing on from a coaching perspective, what do coaches need to know to best support their teams, their athletes from a trauma-informed perspective, particularly as um, kids, student athletes are starting to come back to play after potentially not playing for a while. So kind of mid COVID post COVID, I'm not exactly sure what phase of COVID we're in right now, but, um, but, you know, having coming out from the pandemic and getting back on the field, um, what kinds of things would coaches benefit from knowing as they're interacting with, um, their athletes. Um, so with that being said, I encourage you to continue to check out the website, download what you can. You can order your pin, uh, wheels online. Um, and get those pinwheels garden gardens planted. Do you want to um, ask that you mark your calendars? So um, May next month is our, um, we as this group meets monthly, next month's focus is on National Children's Mental Health Month. Um, and it should, uh, will be a dynamic uh, meeting with uh, a collaborative partnership that has formed between the Resilient Guilford Network, the Trauma Provider Network, Resilience High Point, and the Guilford County System of Care Collaborative for Children's Mental Health. And we'll be jointly focusing on raising awareness about Children's Mental Health Month. Um, we'll hear from psychiatrists, faith communities, mental health providers, parents, um, on the importance of children's mental health and how we can support um, children and families' mental health. So I wanted you to have that um, on your calendar. Please note that next month's meeting is an hour and a half instead of an hour, because we'll be having a, a panel of speakers um, that will be sharing some thoughts and feedback around children's mental health. And as we close out, one of the new pieces that we're adding to all of our meetings is you will get a link um, that invites you to share any feedback uh, or thoughts that you have around our monthly meetings, topics that you think we should integrate, ideas or strategies that you think that, that would be helpful for these meetings. So you'll get a link in your, um, in your email that also focuses on um, gathering information because we truly want these meetings to be as helpful as possible um, to you and to the organization that you work with and to the people that you serve um, and to you just personally and your families. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and just kind of open up the floor to see if there are any questions in the last two minutes or a minute and a half. It looks like we have, we're, we're ending right on time to see if there are any thoughts, questions, ideas, that folks have. I see Angela posted the survey right into the chat box too, which is great. Questions, thoughts, ideas? Hey, this is Mary from the Kellen Foundation. And I just wanted to say, we've heard so much great stuff today here at this meeting. And I was thinking about this from what we can do as individuals. And we shared some ideas and I keep that nice printout um, that Angela shared next to my desk so I can think about that on a daily basis. Um, encouraging everyone to get involved in the policy work that Sharon Hirsch lifted up. Um, we have such big opportunities for funding for children and families and big investments and big policy change that can follow. And then systems work. So thinking about paying attention to what's working and what's not working in our own system of care in Guilford County as we think about children and adults and the interactions and what resources we have and the gaps that are possible. So, and lifting those up in this group. Um, is, you all are so impressive and everyone is doing such great work. And I always am of the mindset when we work together, we can get really great things done. Amazing. Thank you for sharing those comments, Mary. I agree with them 100%. If you have additional information or resources for the month of April or otherwise that you'd like us to include, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we can make sure and include them in the monthly summary. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, plant your pinwheel gardens, continue to spread the word to, to, from awareness to action about what kids need to be safe and well. And thank you for being advocates for children every day. Take care, everyone.